So today I, I wanted to talk about a new flavor of judicial conservatism, which to me basically seems like a more fascist and religious version of what currently dominates that movement called as common good constitutionalism. And my basic understanding of this theory, and I'm just curious what your thoughts are, is that essentially originalism is bad because it confines what conservatives can do specifically when it comes to achieving their religious goals, right? So like you will deal with real like First Amendment limitations if you care at all about the Bill of Rights or the Constitution in general, um, if you try to basically promote laws that go against the First Amendment when it comes to establishment of state religion. And so is that like kind of what this theory is? And also, could you go into like the origins of it? Like how long has it been around? Is it making like a resurgence right now? Is it also like entering into other conservative legal institutions like the federal society? Yeah, absolutely. So like to explain common law or common good constitutionalism, I have to first explain who created it. And that is right. the Professor Adrian uh, Vermeule from Harvard and a little background on him. He has always been a, he's a constitutional professor at Harvard. He also teaches administrative law. He's always been a right winger. He was an originalist for a while. And for anyone who doesn't know, originalism is interpreting the Constitution. And there's so many different flavors of it. But usually what people mean when they say originalism is that you are interpreting the language of the Constitution in how it was intended to be read and in the context of the founding fathers and what it meant at that time. So you're looking at their writings that were happening alongside the creation of the constitution um, to derive that the meaning from it. So he was an originalist professor, but then in 2016, he became Catholic. And when he became Catholic and he was always, you know, a right wing Christian, but then he became a, Christian nationalist, a fascist, Christ, Christo fascist, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, so he started reading more and more of like 13th century Roman law and legal theory that was, you know, created to promote the Catholic religion, the Catholic church and uh, things of that nature. And he's created out of that in 2020 when he published his uh, common good constitutionalism uh, arguments in the Atlantic his new theory. So essentially what it is, is it's a version of a, a play on natural law, which natural law is the idea that there are rights given to us, not by men, but by God or nature or something of that ilk. They are, you know, that we have them there. We don't have to be given them that they are owed to us by the universe or whatever you want to believe in. It's, it's pretty common amongst, um, like Catholic and Christian legal theorists. Uh, so it's it's based off of that. Um, essentially it's it gives it it gives judges, justices the ability to spit in the face of the Constitution. It is a way around the constraints of the Constitution. Whereas uh, originalism, you know, the the whole purpose of it is to uphold the Constitution. And to good, uh, common good uh, constitutionalists, the constitution is an, uh, an obstacle that they have to overcome. So essentially, let's say a judge is making a decision about gay marriage. They can say, well, and erroneously, but they can say, well, gay people can't reproduce. A lack of reproduction isn't in the common good. So therefore, I'm going to say we should not have gay marriage. So things like that, same sort of things like uh, as it applies to abortion, but it's something I found it, it, it's a bogus legal theory. It's bullshit. It's not commonly accepted amongst even right wing uh, legal theorists because they want to uphold some semblance of respectability and some semblance of, uh, you know, having their arguments based on a realistic legal theory that it has been applied in the United States. Because like I said, he created this out of like 13th century Roman legal doctrine 
which isn't the basis for our judicial system in the United States, although he erroneously claims that this is the classical uh, judicial doctrines. It isn't when you're looking at, you know, the Anglican, Anglo-American judicial practices that we have here, because our judicial system is, is entirely, almost entirely based off of the judicial system in England. Mm-hmm. And the judicial system in England is not based off of the judicial system for Rome. So it's it's a silly argument. But there have been, as of this last month, six citations to his book and judicial rulings, most of them in dissents or concurring opinions. But at like at least one of them was cited to in passing, uh, you know, in a you know, in a decision that was made by a judge, which is concerning to see because it is it it is the Trojan horse through which Christian fascists can do whatever the fuck they want with our judicial system. Mm. Yeah, this honestly reminds me of about three years ago, I had a debate with this acquaintance of mine who considered himself a Burkean conservative. And at the time, and of course, this is still relatively fringe, but it's there seem to be more iterations of it into the mainstream, even with someone like Tucker Carlson, at least rhetorically. But I remember having this conversation where I was like, wait a second. I'm like, basically what this comes down to is we can have, like government can be robust and initiate change as long as it adheres to the natural laws. So basically, as long as we have like a patriarchal society and marginalized groups are fully cast aside and not taken into consideration when making legal decisions or political decisions, then sure, you can raise taxes, you can give people healthcare, but it it seems like a way of like fully shutting off like members of the population that they just do not want to deal with whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's not coming from a place because there's already progressive judicial interpretation theories, right? Mm -hmm. There's already a judicial activism. It's not just a conservative thing. It's used by progressives too, which is different because the basis for those theories of interpreting the constitution is still the text of the constitution. Whereas um, in Vermeule's theory, it is essentially saying that the text is a starting point but if, if they think that something that is explicitly in the Constitution isn't in the common good, that they can throw that to the wind and make whatever ruling they want. And the common good is not based off of the will of the people, you know, for one, because in uh, the federal circuits and with um, Supreme Court justices, we don't elect them. So they're unelected individuals, right. but also because they have they don't have to determine what what the people want. It's just about what they think is best for them. So it's essentially creating like a monarchy of these uh, judges and justices and Mm -hmm. allowing them to determine what's best for all of us. Yeah, I mean, I also read it as if you were to set up a theocracy in a country that had relatively strong secular institutions, this is how you would try to do that within those institutions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. The other thing I want to highlight about it is that it goes against one of the fa- founding principles of this country, which is individual liberty, despite mm-hmm. the fact that conservatives love to preach that. And he pretty explicitly says that if something might be in the interest of an individual, but it isn't in his perception of what the common good interest is, then they don't have a right to that. So that's like where things like being trans or being Mm -hmm. gay or having an abortion come into play because those are, you know, individual actions. And if he deems them or if the judge deems them not to be in the common good interest, then then to, to hell with it. But again, we haven't seen it play out too much in our judicial system, but it is it is concerning because if it did and you you know, if it's permeated the higher levels of our judicial system, what do you do if you can't appeal it? Where do you go? Yeah. And this, of course, like is an even worse iteration of just the more mainstream conservative judicial philosophy, because like, for example, even in 1989 in Texas versus Johnson, the flag burning case, like Antonin Scalia was like, yeah, I 
hates these hippies and their long hair and if it were up to me i'd imprison them all but i'm not a king so you have the right to burn the flag right that's your first yeah. amendment rights but it seems like under this um that would not be the case so yeah. <laughs> like there doesn't seem like there's any room for that <laughs> absolutely another little fun tidbit about um about this uh adrian vermule and where this theory came from he explicitly cites to the progress of the 1960s and 70s mm -hmm. as his driving inspiration for creating it, which for anyone who's not aware of what happened in the 60s and 70s, that was when the Civil Rights Act was passed. That's when Brown, or Brown Board of Education was the 50s. But that's when we saw the civil rights movement. We saw all this progress happening. Mm -hmm. 70s, obviously what he means by that is Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. So he's seeing progress happen through the courts he created this theory explicitly to counteract that, to put a stop to that. It, that's actually funny and horrifying because one of my critiques, you know, of the Supreme Court is that historically it is an incredibly reactionary institution, even more so than the presidency and Congress, with the exception, I think, of the Warren Court from like 53 to 69. But that is kind of an aberration. But what this guy decided to do was say, oh, that's an aberration of the way the court functions. Let me use that to make it even worse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And yeah. it's literally to advance. So this man, not only like I'm saying that he's a, a Christo fascist, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that out of my ass. He explicitly yeah. supports a Catholic world government. Oh, interesting. Yes, like that is a a core belief of his since converting to Catholicism, which on its own, you got to be an insane person to want to be convert to be Catholic. Yes. Was, after being raised Catholic, like you have to kneel and stand. You got to shake it. Like it sucks. It's a shitty fucking religion. You don't just get to go to heaven because you believe in it. You got to do good shit too. So it's anyone who's like willing to go into that. Uh, you know, I mean, I will flag. say that like before even going into this guy's Wikipedia page, because I was reading an American prospect article over him. And then I was like, Okay, I'm like, this guy was probably a Catholic convert. <laughs> like, that's yeah. kind of what I thought, because I, uh, these are the types that, um, you know, they really get into it. And of course, like, uh, it's also tied into like weirder conceptions of white supremacy, like, you know, tying it to like, you know, classical law and the Romans. And uh, I, I re remember reading that he's like, oh, well, the government needs to ensure peace, justice and abundance to people. What that actually means, who knows? And that's kind of the point, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, essentially it would allow for the the government to or the judicial system to take actions that would directly harm individuals if they think that's in the good of the the common good of, of everybody. So slave labor of only a few people, you know, if it's serving the common good of, you know, enriching his buddies or, you know, feeding a population somewhere, that could be justifiable under his theory. Like he only believes in a couple of, it, it, one of the big aspects of natural law is that there's some like evil, like true evil. And one of the things he thinks is evil is theft mm -hmm. without, without any qualifiers, right. just theft. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of libertarians, taxes, our theft. And one of the only other things he mentioned that he believes is evil is murder without some other type of justification for it. So, you know, not state sponsored murder or not, you know, very loosely based self defense murder or things like that. So he could even like just, you know, flat out say murder is evil. That deserved a qualifier, mm -hmm. but not theft. Right. <laughs> which uh, just shows what his priorities are that's actually very interesting because i think that potentially sheds light into and i'm curious about this how common good constitutionalism still is an extension of just general like judicial judicial conservative philosophy in this country because under that logic, right? I mean, of course, there's like a more like religious and moralizing angle to it, but mm -hmm. you could easily return back. Like you could easily say, like, I don't believe in individual rights. Those are degenerate, basically, <laughs> right? Yeah. But but um, you know, under natural law, like survival of the fittest, the the strong will, you know, usurp the weak. 
And so if these corporations are big enough, if they have a monopoly in a certain area, if you uh, aren't able to negotiate better wages or they want you to work like 80 hours a week, right? That kind of seems consistent with what he's advocating for. So in that end, it seems like a real return to like the Supreme Court of like, you know, the late 1800s or early 1900s in this country, like the Lochner era, as it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck the Lochner era. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's sort of part of common good constitutionalism is that if when it comes to like legislative interpretation or like reviewing a law that's been passed, if it's not flagrantly a violation of their conception of natural law, then they should defer to, you know, traditional uh, judicial interpretation means that have already been established in practice. But it, it's interesting because at the end of the day, when it comes to judicial interpretation, they can pretty much just do whatever the fuck they want. They could find a way to justify whatever their preconceived mm-hmm. belief was. And they do a lot, you know, we saw, or they could just lie. Saw that in the case um, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but Supreme Court case about the the man who was a football coach and he was praying on the fifty yard line with all his his players and mm-hmm. and it was very blatant and very uh, egregious. And Justice Alito was just like, "Oh, it was a private act of prayer," yeah. and it was ve- that was very much not that. So much so that I um, can't remember who wrote the dissent. It was either Kagan or Sotomayor, but they included pictures of this massive prayer and him like laying his hands on the helmets of these players on the 50 yard line, but it doesn't matter. Cause what, what are your descent? Your, what, what can we do? That's the highest court. So they do lie and they do just push their biases through regardless. But I mean, they do it in a way where they're forced to justify it through, you know, the text of the constitution and existing precedent. This goes against that. You don't have to create that justification. You don't have to look at precedent and evaluate it you don't have to look at the you know you don't have to even so much look at the text of the constitution and evaluate it so long as you can say that this is a a flagrant violation of your concept of of natural law Mm -hmm. it's a little different in that way but Mm -hmm. i mean it defers in legal theory that way but as far as in practice goes i mean they'll just just do whatever they want at the end of the day yeah yeah. (laughs) Because I guess that's another thing with me is just seeing how like, you know, even using their logic, you could find a way to include the worst aspects of social conservatism, but also like the worst aspects of economic libertarianism and mix them together. Yeah. <laughs> like, you could definitely do that. Um, I guess the final thing I want to touch on is I remember reading that, you know, Vermeule the two cases that he's the most adamant about and just the most offended by, it should be no surprise, is Obergefell, so uh, legalization of gay marriage or same-sex marriage. And then this one I find interesting. I'm just curious your thoughts on, because first of all, I'm kind of surprised this case was even decided this way, but I'm curious with the way things are going and the emergence of this theory, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, how that that may alter this course but you know in 2020 we had the bostick versus clayton county case which said that um title seven of the civil rights act which prohibits workplace discrimination based on gender orientation or gender identity sexual orientation rights that um or that title seven specifically prohibited those two things and this was if i remember correctly in the majority opinion, it included Roberts, but also Gorsuch, right? And yeah. one, yeah, like I, I, I kind of wonder, like, because I remember reading at the time, thinking, oh, like this is good, but I'm kind of surprised that it was also six three. They got two conservatives for this, right? Um, but also, so one, like, what do you think happened there? But, but second of all, do you think? that because the federalist society obviously plays a huge part in you know who makes it to the supreme court if there's a republican president right they literally gave a list to trump and he just went off the list so is this type of like common good constitutionalism is it kind of creeping more into the mainstream even to like the federalist society and do you see it's like really taking grounds and you know to a point where like 
like there are judges that do care about appearing prestigious or like they actually give a shit about the law rights um but at a certain point once you have enough power will that matter (laughs) yeah as far as it creeping into like institutions i don't think it's taken much of a hold yet but that doesn't really mean much for the future because it is very new it was you know his first article about it was published in 2020 and his book was published later in that year there isn't a, a huge sentiment of you know support for it within the mm-hmm. legal community as soon as it was published there was a lot of even conservative uh legal scholars who wrote responses to it and disagreed with it and critiqued it um but like i mentioned earlier there it has been his book has been cited to by in at least six decisions or um or concurring opinions or dissenting opinions what have you so it's not and, and, you know, we can think about how many hundreds of thousands of cases are decided mm-hmm. a year and re- relative to that. It's it's particularly small. But as far as the goals of the Federalist Society go, if it is more um, if it's more expedient for them to adopt this, they'll do it. They'll do mm-hmm. whatever it takes to push their right. worldview on America. They'll be willing to spend any amount of money to do it. And there is this this a lot of judges like to present themselves with a degree of prestige mm-hmm. um and to seem like even their most heinous decisions are based on accepted theory and forms of interpretation and, or you know precedent so i could see it taking a while for them to want to explicitly be citing to this doctrine as the basis for their decision making but if it becomes more popularized, I wouldn't be surprised if these because as soon as the federal Federalist Society says, hey, this is our new right. policy, they will use it. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. they'll if, if the Federalist Society says dance, they'll dance. Mm-hmm. Whatever is going to you know make the investors in the Federalist Society more money is whatever is going to be best for them. But because this is right now such a um it's it's you it's more of a morality based theory mm-hmm. it's which yeah. he doesn't he doesn't like beat around the bush about it he admits that it should be based in morality it's not necessarily in the financial interest as of now for the federalist society to adopt it but you know it, there's no reason why it couldn't be used to advance you know their economic policies so you know mm-hmm. if, if they see it as beneficial they will and they'll they'll adopt it and if they adopt it you know, the their judges and justices will do whatever the fuck they ask them to. Saw that mm-hmm. with um uh Citizens United. Because mm-hmm. the, this case was not supposed to be about what the decision right. made it become. It was supposed to be a limited ruling on the facts of the case and instead became this horrific precedent that has forever changed elections in this country. Yeah, that was really cool. Um <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I I mean that that's definitely true. And I because I, I do think at, at a certain point, like yeah, like you're saying, federal society right now probably still testing the waters on this, but much to our horror, of course, uh, you know, the head of the federal society received, I believe, the largest donation of dark money, political dark money contribution of one point six billion dollars last year from some old dude in Chicago who, who like made like I guess it made surge protectors right <laughs> yeah um anyway there's a good story about that on, on the the lever by David Sirota that I recommend to people but anyway uh you know thanks for taking you know the time and uh again sorry I was late <laughs> it's okay I will say if anyone wants to read more of the disagreements with common good constitutionalism professor Garrett Epps from uh I believe University of what's it a Baltimore school if I'm not mistaken either way he did a really good takedown of it just like days after it was published also in the Atlantic so everyone mm-hmm. go check that out for sure if you want to learn more about the dangers of common good constitutionalism oh well, that will be a good bedtime read <laughs> All right. Well, you know, thanks again and have a good rest of your night. Thanks. You too. All right. Thank you.